we have a chance to uh, ask uh, questions uh, of uh, Will Kimlicka, who says he's interested in feedback because of this new and exciting paper. Uh, please uh, give your name uh, when you ask a question and note that we are a video, uh, we're doing a video of this, videotaping the proceedings. Um, okay. Uh, Eva, start with Eva Kate. Wait for the microphone, it's coming. Thank you very much for your paper and thank you for talking about how we need another framework uh, in order to talk about animal uh, rights. Um, the, I have a number of things. First of all, uh, thank you for including disabled people amongst the multicultural because I think that's been difficult to get in there in the race, class, and gender grouping. Um, but uh, on many, uh, for many of the people who have been oppressed in one way or another, they of course have been compared to animals and have been compared to animals in, uh, uh, in uh, not a very flattering way, not because animals are loved. Um, and when, and I think that for one thing produces a certain resistance to begin with. Um, but there's a group of philosophers, I'm, you know, that really do uh, take the position that um, we uh, counter the rights of some people um, in juxtaposition to, or that we should, in juxtaposition to the rights of animals. I mean, the arguments of Peter Singer and Jeff McMahon um, explicitly sometimes, uh, implicitly at other times, uh, do want to demote the moral status of some human beings, namely those with cognitive, severe cognitive disabilities, uh, and promote, uh, of course, could demote them to animals and at the same time promote those of animals. Right? Um, so, uh, of course, the demotion is going to be more salient than the promotion. But uh, that's deeply, deeply problematic. And, I, and they use it as a way of making the case for animal welfare, right? Uh, that's what the argument is. And um, I'd really like to see a whole lot better set of arguments than those. Uh. Thank you. Please. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I mean, in, in the book Zoopolis, um, we uh, have a, an extended discussion of, of this issue. So I am uh, absolutely not at all a supporter of of the Singer and McMahon position, I, it would, I, I don't know how, how, how deeply to get into this. So, um, the, the, as I tried to hint at in the paper, the fundamental category that we're working with is the idea of, of selves and selfhood. And, uh, and that and, and being a self, having selfhood, having a subjective experience of the world, on our account, gets you inviolable rights. And so, whereas, whereas on Singer and McMahon's views, it's not enough to be a self, to have a subjective experience of the world. You have to have something else to qualify for the right not to be used and harmed for other people's benefits. And I, I, Sue and I radically disagree with that. And uh, and I totally accept. I totally agree that one one of one of the offensive uh, characteristics or consequences of the Singer McMahon position is to is to exclude people with uh, severe cognitive disabilities from the, the community of bearers of inviolable rights. The, the 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 issue about whether the long history of comparing oppressed groups with animals in unflattering ways. I mean what. What, what do we, how do we take that into account? 
in our theorizing and in our political discourse. Um, I, 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 I totally understand that given that history, people, that particularly members of press groups, get very nervous when they see any comparison, whatever the reason, whatever the motive, whatever the goal, when they see any comparison between their struggles and, and animal rights struggles. But I, I, I believe, uh, I mean, so uh, as I tried to imply with my discussion of the toolkits we have available, uh, that there are ways of, of making these compare of, 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 of showing the links, the continuities in, in, the, in the goods of our lives and in the harms we're subject to that, that uh, across species lines that, that uh, are not insulting or trivializing or denigrating. And, uh, but I also think that we are in such a desperate need of rethinking human-animal relationships that we need, we need to learn from every possible source we, we can't, we can't, intellectually, we can't afford not to explore the, the, the commonalities as well as the, the discontinuities in structures of oppression and domination and coercion and paternalism uh, that, that, that work in both the human and animal case. We just can't afford to, to, to stop ourselves from thinking through those uh, those comparisons, because we desperately need to learn, I and mean, we we're just in, we're so intellectually impoverished in thinking through human-animal relations. So that would be my justification for. Uh, Elena, right here. Elena Cohen. Oh, Elena Cohen, the Graduate Center. Um, I wonder if maybe and what you think about it, if the break comes earlier in this story where it's that people haven't accepted that animals share in this common conception of the good and that it's this continuous scale and that having the left have a coherent reason for the violence against animals, it's like really much, much sooner that it's not even problematized and maybe that's part of why there's a silence because it isn't even problematic enough yet that you have to have a justification. Yeah, so I... I um, uh, um, uh, th th I, so, th this was th this has been a concern I had that, th um, and and a, a, a puzzle I had about whether I, I should even bother writing this paper, um, because I, at the end of the day, I actually completely agree with you. I think the reason why the left is indifferent to the suffering of animals is because, uh, uh, yeah, because they're just animals, and so we don't need that. We don't need to justify our mistreatment. They're just animals. And, and as you say, that hasn't been problematized enough for people to even to need any, any more uh, meaningful or sophisticated justification, like the fact that it might link up with, with uh, cultural imperialism. And so I, I, I think this paper may give a misleading impression that the, the real reason or the fundamental reason why the left is indifferent to, to uh, animal rights is this specter of cultural imperialism, when in fact, I actually completely agree with you, it's, it's deeper or earlier. And, um, but, um, um, but I'm I, 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 at least at, in academia. There's there's been an, there's been enough of a um, uh, rise of animal studies um, that 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 that, uh, that it has been problematized. And, and I think, you know, for those who haven't read it, I, I, this, this uh, our, our Luke paper on the fight for animal studies within sociology, just the discipline of sociology, is interesting. That, that, that uh, the, 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 there you have an explicit context in which the advocates and champions for, for oppressed human groups are, are confronted with specific proposals for, for uh, animal studies. And... Um, and and the, the language in which they justify it is this, is this worry about cultural. Uh, Mitchell Abalafia over here. Hi, thank you, Will. Mitchell Abalafia, Manhattan College. Um, I'm curious about the toolkit that you were mentioning yeah. and whether or not we really have the same kind of tools. Let me just offer an alternative hypothesis about the left. One of the reasons why the left doesn't respond in the way you'd like them to respond is that there's an assumption that the oppressed, to some degree, have to participate in overcoming their yep. oppression. 
And that's been true going way back to Marx, et cetera, and in terms of the 20th century, various groups. And it's still a very built-in assumption that somehow people have to be motivated. And if we start thinking about exceptions, there aren't very many. You can think about maybe children, but children are very closely attached to parents, and maybe severely handicapped people who have relatives who are closely attached to them. But for other groups, we sort of assume you know, minorities have to get involved, women have to get involved, et cetera. So animals seem to be in a very unique position here, and I'm not sure about the toolkit. Right. So Good. So... Um... Uh, I, I agree that uh, one, one fundamental part of that toolkit that has developed in the left uh, is, is about uh, that those who are affected by decisions need to be present at the table. Nothing, with, nothing about us without us, as they say in the disability movement. Um, and uh, that... that so the, the, the toolkit in, in, in these other cases involves representation, participation, voice by the members of the oppressed groups themselves. And uh, people don't, don't see how that applies in the animal case. Um, okay, so a couple, of, a couple of responses. One is that I, I don't think that... Um, uh, I mean, th there are exceptions in the human case... You, you've mentioned them already, I, I, but but we have we, th these are these are um, people have thought about what is the toolkit available for um, uh, pursuing an emancipatory agenda in relation to people with, uh, with cogn severe cognitive disabilities or children, um, and we we have so we recognize that that that, that, that the same tools we use in relation to uh, some groups aren't going to be applicable to other human groups, but but. But uh, we do have some tools uh, in relation to those people who are not able to, to articulate their interests in propositional form. Um, but also, I want, would want to say that with respect to animals, we shouldn't rule out the... the, the so w with respect to animals, firstly, I would want to highlight, as Jason Reibel does, that we have very good evidence that animals resist oppression. So they may not resist it in the form of marches, uh, or placards or petitions, but but we have we have um, but but there is long histories of animal resistance, uh, and uh, so so Jason Robel writes about how animals resist in zoos, how they resist in farms, and so on, um, and 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 uh, and we can think about what would be the mechanisms for um, soliciting the subjective good of animals. Again, it's not going to take the form of asking them to hand, you know, to write out in propositional form what, what their preferences are. But, I, but we do have, we do have uh, uh, techniques available. Uh, these things have been developed in ethnography and elsewhere, ethology elsewhere, to uh, create choice situations that would enable, that would enable the revealing of, this, of the subjective good of animals. Um, and so I, I, don't, I, 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 I don't see this, I mean, it, it's a challenge, it's gonna be hard. Uh, the question of how we interpret the behavior uh, of, of animals so as, to, uh, so as to get at their subjective good is, is, uh, is a challenge. But I, I don't, I, I, all I would say is uh, we shouldn't think of this, I would, I would resist the thought that in, when it comes to humans, you know, we have simple and transparent understanding of each other's subjective good because we all can articulate our, our views in propositional form. And so, and so that's simple and clear and transparent and that, that the interests of animals are opaque and mysterious. Uh, the fact is there's a lot of hard work we need to do to understand the subjective good of many human beings and there are, there are ways of soliciting the subjective good of animals. Um, and and so I, I, I do. It's it. And this is something we we talk about in the book that, that that it is part of our story of animal rights and animal liberation that we. Okay. Just a quick follow up. So would you want to say that this is as much a story about moral psychology as it is about rights, and that maybe the use of rights or the language, what have you, could be overplayed in this situation? No, I I. I, I mean, you're not going to agree with that, but I'm just going to throw it out anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no. So so just just to. Um, and this, this in a way goes back to uh, Eva Kate's first question. I, I'm, I'm 
the, the bedrock for me, I, I think, what, um, I believe we need the language of rights. I believe we, uh, because rights express the idea of inviolability, that, that, that we are not resources for other people's good. We cannot be harmed and killed for other people's good. This is the idea behind in, in, inviolable rights. And, 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 the, and the, the, I don't think we have any hope um, of uh, any meaningful change in our treatment of animals so long as we continue to believe in the idea that they do not possess this sort of inviolability. If we continue to believe that we have the right to harm them and, and kill them for our benefit, but we just shouldn't do it so, we shouldn't do so much of it. Uh, we shouldn't do it with so much cruelty or whatever. I just think that's hopeless. The forces of capitalism, the forces of research are just going to create more as they are. Every day, more and more animals are being subjected to harm across the globe. And that will continue, to, the structure of animal exploitation will continue to expand unless we commit ourselves to the principle that animals are inviolable. And I, I think we have no way of articulating that thought except through, through our rights language. We have uh, four or five people waiting, uh, six including me, so Mujahid, please say your full name, Bilici. Mujahid Bilici, John Jay College. Um, left's reluctance to you know, accept uh, animal rights, could it be because of uh, the fact that it will require a new political philosophy, a post-secular, post-humanism, to put it in your terms? that the animals are not uh, subjects in the way human beings are, that they don't have this structure of care, so human beings are shepherding them and so on. Since you are talking about multiculturalization and drawing on other traditions and benefiting from them and so on. So a, a, a concept of inviolable rights for animals could be deployed only when we evacuate subjectivity as an exclusive property of human being. Are you ready for including God in your political philosophy? Uh, so, I, what was the last? Well, the last part basically means this. Only if you have something above or beyond human beings as a uh, subject who can uh, decide on what is right a moral philosophy that is not secular, can you, have, can you secure inviolability for animals? Otherwise, dependency will continue, and so I, I don't see how animals can be protected from human beings. Um, well, that, that, that's, that sounds like it's a... Um, you're asking questions above my pay grade, as it were. I, 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 um, I don't have, you know... I, I, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to avoid uh, kind of deep meta-ethical questions about what's the sources of normativity or uh, the nature of rationality. I, I'm, I'm all reasoning and so on. So, but let me just r repeat my. I believe. So I, you know, I, whether, whether in the day, at the end of the day, can we make any sense of of morality without appeal to God? I, I don't know. I. I I, I think so, but I, but I don't know. I, I, um, so, I, uh, what? But what I do believe, what, what is, just to repeat what I said earlier, that that selfhood, that that is, what, the the, the function of inviolable. So, so the, the, the argument is that that animals and humans have a subjective experience of the world and that inviolable rights are needed, and that creates a certain kind of vulnerability. Beings who have a subjective experience of the world are, sub are, 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 are confronted with certain kinds of vulnerabilities, certain kinds of harms, and that the function of, of rights is to protect these vulnerable selves from certain important kinds of harms. And I, I believe that that, uh, that that provides a natural way of extending rights from humans to animals, and, uh, and, 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 and moreover, that if we say that you need more than selfhood to be entitled to inviolable rights, the, the effect will not only be, this again goes back to Eva's question, the, the result will not only be to exclude animals, it'll be to exclude a lot of humans. And not just one human, I mean the fact is that, that um, 
the, that, that, the, the, the extent to which humans possess the capacity for what? Kantian moral autonomy is something that is, it's unequally distributed across humans, but it's also unequally distributed over the course of one's lifetime. We're not born with it. We often lose it later in life. So this, this, this you know, if, what, if, you, if you say that in order to be the bearer of rights, you need, to be, you need to be able to exercise moral autonomy, that is something that some of us possess at some points in our lives. That is a totally inadequate basis for any theory and practice of human rights. I believe the only stable, sustainable pr basis for a practice of human rights is selfhood. But then we have no, base, no uh, non-arbitrary basis for not extending it to animals. That, that, that's, insofar as I have moral foundations, that, that's it. Uh, David. Hi, David Nagy, uh, Graduate Center. Thanks for the talk. Um, at one point you mentioned the objection that um, a lot of people might not be able to adopt the vegan lifestyle, yeah. and it's possible that, that I missed it, but I didn't hear you give a full defense. So, like, uh, in particular, I think you could say there are many communities where, because of climate or geography, they are unable to grow the amount of plants and vegetation necessary to sustain themselves, yeah. and if they didn't eat animals, they would starve. So, how would you, or, and there are some people who maybe for medical reasons need to eat meat, or they would suffer, their health would decline a lot. So, how would you respond to cases like that? Yeah. So, um, uh, so I, I mean, I do. I I I, I accept the, the criticism that kind of early versions of vegan outreach were 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 not attentive to the fact that the accessibility, the, the costs, the opportunities, and so on both material and social, uh, of a vegan lifestyle vary, clearly, um, within societies and across societies. So, um, I, uh, uh, so, I, I, I would say a couple of things. One is that, um, I, that, um, we should, if one accepts the animal rights position, uh, that um, there is a duty to create the conditions under which vegan lifestyles are accessible to people. And that's, that's an obligation uh, that falls on all of us to, to make it available to all of us. Um, and I... I, I uh, and that may that may take time. Uh, it may may not be something that could be immediately achieved overnight. Um, I, I, I and um, but I, I accept and, and I'm willing to, to 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 accept and to acknowledge that this. Uh, so I, I'm not against. I'm not in favor of the idea that that's, that that some societies get a permanent exemption. Uh, that because, they, as you say, they live in a particular geography or topo topo topography or whatever, that they, they are permanently exempted from having to make any efforts to, uh, to, to um, make possible a way of living that doesn't involve the exploitation of animals. Uh, what, 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 would be, what would be involved in moving to the circumstances under which one could lead flourishing lives without the exploitation of animals is going to vary from case to case. Um, and so, uh, but I, but, uh, but and, and we could t we could talk about very specific cases if you're interested. But I mean, I, I, I so I, I there's I believe there's a general duty on all of us to to put ourselves to create the the circumstances of justice in our relations. I think the vast vast majority of people living in North America are already in the circumstances where justice is possible in our relations to to, to animals. There 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 may be some circumstances. Uh, particularly in, in other parts of the world, where, where they're not yet in the circumstances of justice with animals. But I, th I believe even in those circumstances, there's a duty to try to move into the circumstances with justice. Uh, is that... Can I... Uh, Very quick, yeah. All right. What I want to press you on is, even if it's possible for some communities to eventually get to the yeah. point where they can become vegans, until they get to that point, they might have to eat meat to survive. And if you think that... The 
animals really have an inviolable right to life, it would seem we'd, we'd have to call this immoral, killing them to survive. Right. They, so They'd be morally obligated to, to die if they can't yeah. do that. I mean, the... the um, so we, we have a discussion. That's <laughs> not a very satisfactory answer, but uh, we, do, we do talk about this in the book, and I don't want to... It's a slightly extended discussion, but the... the I mean, there is a, there is a, even in the, in the case of interhuman relations, even, so forget about animals, in our, in relationships between humans, there are defenses of necessity. And so, you know, if, like the famous case of the, the airplane crashes in the Andes, and the only way some people can survive is, is to be cannibals, uh, is, is that, is that a crime? If, if, if everyone's going to die unless some people, you know, is, is, that, is that murder or is, that, is, there, is, that, is there a defense of necessity? Um, and most philosophers and I, many married jurisdictions would say there is it. That's a, that is a legitimate defense of necessity. So if, if the, um, and, and similarly, if, if someone, you know, in other contexts, if, if, uh, if someone is about to, 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 is threatening to kill you, you have a right of self-defense. Uh, and so too, if there were animals that were, you know, if an elephant was about to, to kill a villager in India, there's a right of self-defense. So it's not, so, but, but, so, I mean, the idea of inviolable rights is complicated in the human case as well. That there are these qualifications and exceptions. You've got to be in the circumstances of justice, there are, there are exemptions of self-defense, there are exemptions of necessity, and, and so, yeah. Okay, let's hear from Clarissa before she escapes. Thanks for your talk, Carissa Velis from Graduate Center. I wanted to disagree on a sociological point you made. Um, so you said uh, people sometimes argue or might think that um, if they accept animals on a more or less equal stance with respect to human rights, um, then somehow the, social, the fight is, is harder. And you say, well, empirical facts actually aren't, don't, don't agree with that. Um, people who, act, who accept animals are, uh, or people who reject animals as, or as different from, from humans are more likely to see other human groups as inferior. Um, but I'm not sure that empirical evidence is actually relevant for the case. So think of it uh, this way. Imagine there's a, a high school girl or boy who wants to be popular. And so there are two ways to do it. One is to convince the whole high school that really we're all equal and we can all participate in everything. And the other way is to bully someone else and to become part of the popular group. Um, so I think even though in abstract terms the left uh, agrees with many things, in, in, on the streets and in particular cases and in particular groups, it's really about a, a, a more local fight. So gay men um, discriminate against lesbians, for example, and, and there are many other examples, Mexicans against blacks in the U.S. Or, uh, so I think that's a sociological point, and the, the, the empirical you, you, uh, evidence you mentioned is not does not weigh against that. Uh, yeah, but so just but just so I understand what what um, I mean, I, I agree that those dynamics that you describe exist, but um, uh, the um, the question is. Uh, whether the, the the question I'm I'm interested in is whether uh, reasserting the species hierarchy um, provides an effective tool, effective political resource. Whether or not it's philosophically sustainable, does it provide an effective political resource for oppressed groups to? struggle against majority indifference, prejudice, stereotypes, or whatever. So, I mean, it, it could be that, that say, for, for as, as appears to be the case, if it, for African Americans in their civil rights struggle to sanctify species difference, it may serve a number of psychological needs, uh, it may have a number of effects, uh, 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 in all sorts of ways, but the one I'm focusing on is a, specific, is a more specific question. Does the sanctification of these species' borders help in diminishing the forms of, of exclusion, prejudice, 
uh, stereotyping or whatever that the, the majority imposes on the minority. Right, and my point is that I think the empirical evidence you, uh, you mentioned does not bear on that question because it might not in general, but it might for a local group. So if you see the big picture, it might really not help um, humans beings, oppressed human beings in general. Right. But for a specific group, it okay. might be, be a, a very important tool. So for gay men to discriminate against lesbians and animals and other kinds right. of um, right. subjective beings might be a, a tool that gets them on a higher, uh, higher up on the hierarchy. Yeah, okay. I, I, so I'll, I'll, I'll need to think about that. I, I guess, yeah. Um, okay. I, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm yeah, okay. Uh, I, I guess I'm interested in, uh, uh, yeah, okay. I, uh, I, uh, I, I from, 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 from the perspective of, from a normative conception of the left's commitment to emancipation, I, 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 uh, I, 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 I think we want an account of, what ways of asserting status and dignity uh, um, reduce injustice? Uh, so the fact that a, a stigmatized group can move up a hierarchy by, by pushing another group down in a local context um, uh, uh, a, a human group can uh, can enhance its status by pushing another human group down is is not uh, th that's not going to count as part of the toolkit for an emancipatory left. Um, uh, anyway, I, I need I need to think more about that. Um, I would just like to inter intersperse one sort of small comment about Marx himself and the mm -hmm. interpretation. I yeah. think that there are really two tendencies in Marx, and you emphasize one, and I agree that it's the dominant one in several respects. Both the human dominion over nature idea is, is, is the dominant view and the domination of nature. So I think that's right. And also his account of species being specifically about human beings as uh, human purposive activity, uh, it, you know, purpose of activity is human species being. So I agree overall, but I do think the other uh, note in Marx that is sort of un distinctive in the tradition, uh, as against the tradition that preceded him, is the very idea of human beings as part of nature as an, uh, in a way that almost seems to have been neglected before him and then subsequently also, except in Feuerbach. So I think that there is some some basis for uh, an alternative view within Marx himself, although I agree with you, it wasn't the dominant view. So that's just a footnote. No need to answer. Okay, Nanette. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask you two things. Um, they're not connected, yeah, the two things. Uh, w one is uh, what you said about cruelty, that appealing to cruelty, uh, uh, being against cruelty, is inherently biased against minorities. And you re refer to the law as in in incorporating that. And that may be true, I don't know. But in terms of um, anti-cruelty activists, it's certainly not the case because there are many majority practices, including experimentation, uh, wearing fur, all sorts of practices that are majoritarian practices that anti-cruelty activists have have, have advocated, so I think we should at least distinguish between the law and the, adv you know, the activists. Um, and the other thing is this uh, argument um, that, there's no, that there's a continuum of sentience between all um, animals, and there's no way to draw a line where such that some humans aren't gonna fit into um, some of those somewhere else along the continuum, such that you can say up to here you have rights and below that you don't. Um, but there's something deeply unsatisfying about that argument because it, it doesn't say anything about what is it about sentience per se of any shape that connects it to, let's say, a right not to die. I can see the sentience of suffering as 
being connected to not causing pain and suffering. But sentience as such, one would look for some sort of more intrinsic argument, and I wonder if you have any up your sleeve. <laughs> you wrote a book <laughs> about it. I uh, good. Okay, so on the, on the first question, um, it's of course true that, that uh, many activists use the language of cruelty to criticize majority practices. And, and it's of course true that many majority practices involve cruelty. Uh, so I, uh, uh, th- 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 that's, I didn't mean to imply that, that somehow um, one, one starts to speak nonsense to, to accuse majority practices of cruelty. That, that's not, that's not uh, semantically uh, an impossible claim. Uh, what, what, um, uh, and and so, so the English language allows us to, to, to use cruelty in a broader range of cases than the law does, given that the law explicitly exempts customary practices of, uh, from, from charges of cruelty. But, uh, so I, I, in one sense I just I, I agree with that, but uh, I believe that there's no way of uh, drawing a line. So given that humans do not need to eat meat or to wear leather or to view animals in zoos or whatever uh, in order to, to lead good lives, there, there is no... The, all, all of, so let me just repeat. All of the suffering that involve, is involved in those practices is unnecessary... And, and therefore, all of it is cruel, it, it, you know. And if, if, but, and so, uh, so you can either, so you can have, so, and so one could say, any, anything other than the full animal rights agenda is cruel, because it's an unnecessary suffering. That, that would be consistent, but then we would just be. But then cruelty isn't an alternative discourse to the animal rights agenda. It's just we just interpret cruelty in light of our animal rights commitments. But if one is proposing that cruelty is an independent moral discourse that we can use, divorced from an animal rights agenda, to distinguish those forms of unnecessary suffering that are permissible from those forms of unnecessary suffering that are not permissible, I believe that's. There is no basis for doing that, and that what's going there is no intellectually credible way of doing that. And what's going to enter in, whether one likes it or not, is cultural bias. And so, uh, if if one's trying to to take the the, the universe of cases in which we we are in, in, imposing unnecessary suffering, because again, humans don't need to eat meat. So, in this universe of cases of unnecessary suffering, we're going to subdivide some of them as being cruel. That I, that I, it's 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 uh, I I I think we are inviting I think we are inviting culturally biased assessments. It's it's going to be inevitable that the things that we're accustomed to that are customary in our in our particular social context are going to be seen as okay and reasonable and humane and and the practices of other groups that we're that we're not familiar with and that we 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 distrust and that we dislike are much much more likely to be seen as cruel so uh, yeah so i don't want it to be a point about the semantics of cruelty because i agree that the word can be used more broadly but but i do want to argue i do believe that if that's the discourse we're using it it opens the door it invites culturally biased assessments on the question of what, what sentience, how sentience connects to inviolable rights, so the, the uh, I mean, so my view is that beings who have a subjective experience of the world, uh, as I said, they're they're, uh, they're subject to certain kinds of harms and vulnerabilities, but but all it, but not just suffering. Uh, beings that have a subjective experience of the world, uh, f- their life is precious to them. Uh, they care about their about their life, and so uh, the idea, which in 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 uh, Singer and elsewhere, that that, that although that, that sentience gets you rights uh, not to suffer, but doesn't get you a right to life, and so that painless killing 
of sentient beings is okay uh, because all that sentience gives you is, is an, inter and an interest not in suffering but doesn't give you an interest in life. I just think it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, sentient beings uh, care about their lives. Their life is precious to them. And so it, it, I, I think it makes perfect sense to connect the idea of sentience not just to a, a, a right not to be, have suffering inflicted on one, but the right to, to life. The, the, okay. uh, we have two more questions. Perhaps Adam will, you go first and then in the back. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Well, it's just a quick question. So on a very practical note, I, I, I take it that in any case of conflict between, let's say, uh, a minority claim of right to continue some exploitative practice towards animals, let's say the hunting of polar bears in the north, a conflict between that and a claim of animal rights, uh, the polar bears' rights not to be killed or exploited in any way, the animal rights are going to win out. Um, and so I take it that what you want is some kind of non-biased, indiscriminate, tough, moral and legal uh, action against these exploitative practices in society. So both uh, exploitative practices perpetrated by the majority and the majority in a non-discriminate way, in a non-biased way. Um, I take it that that's, that's what you want. Uh, but my question is whether you think that the fact that some practices perpetrated by a minority or it's a traditional minority practice um, carries any kind of lingering normative force of its own. So does it have any kind of residual uh, does it make a difference that it's a minority's practice? Uh, so might you think that, for instance, we should go after the ma majority's practice first, uh, both legally and morally in terms of criticism, or should we make sure that there's an extensive amount of dialogue conducted before we go after minorities, or should we leave them some room for autonomy? Should there be legal and moral exceptions in the case of minorities? That's the question. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... There's so many different levels at, at answering that question. So I, I think philosophically that there, there are no cultural rights in animals. So I, you, you, the, 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 the fact that something is a practice of a culture does not give you rights to use animals. Uh, and so, um, again, I want to... There are, there are these... Uh, qualifications about necessity, they, they, and sometimes you're not in the circumstances of justice. There are going to be, there are going to be the exceptions about self-defense and necessity, but that's got nothing to do with cultural practices. The fact that it's a cultural practice does not give you the right to, to, to harm animals. Uh, so that, that's just at a philosophical claim. I just, I, the, just as you, you can't invoke culture to say, you know, if, if, if slavery, has, human slavery has been a practice in a particular culture, you don't have a cultural right to other to, to children to enslave them, we we don't have cultural rights over other people. We don't have cultural rights over other other sentient beings. Um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, I mean the the the, the rights of of of, uh, of selves uh, take precedence over cultural rights. And uh, in terms of the political strategy, if you like. Um, I mean, the, the uh, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, I, I, I do think we need to be very attentive to the ways in which animal rights advocacy can unintentionally operate to relegitimize hierarchies, and so one one needs to be one needs to acknowledge and be held ethically accountable for the way in which one's animal advocacy can intentionally or unintentionally but predictably reproduce, ex exacerbate racial hierarchies. So you need to think about forms of animal advocacy that will not have that effect. But, but, I, 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 but, but that's complicated because I actually think, and this is something Claire Kim argues in her articles, that exempting minorities in its own way uh, reproduces these, these uh, uh, cultural and, and uh, racial hierarchies. So basically, what you, you know, if, if there is a broad social consensus about the rights of animals. I mean, we're nowhere near that, but let's imagine that that develops. Uh, but we exempt minorities. Uh, we're, we're, that, in a heavily racialized society, will be, will be interpreted in Orientalist terms, that this, that this, it's, that this minority is, is uh, exotic 
that uh, they're out, they fall outside the boundaries of moral debate. We, um, we have this, what we take to be compelling ethical justification for the rights of animals, but we're not going to ask for, we're not, we're not going to expect minorities to comply with it, we're not going to ask minorities to give some justification for their treatment of animals, we're just going to let them be. That, that, that way of excluding minorities f from, the ethical, uh, fr from the ethical accountability for the treatment of animals uh, has, 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 uh, has complicated, complex effects. It, it might look like what it is is giving, uh, is, is that it's somehow showing respect to the minority uh, or, or acknowledging its autonomy or its self government or whatever. But in a heavily racialized society, it will also almost certainly have these kind of orientalizing and, and exoticizing effects. And so I think it's really important that if we, if, if we want to contest these, uh, these uh, cultural and racial hierarchies, that we don't, we don't view minorities as somehow unable to engage in, in that, 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 that they're unable of having ethical relations with animals. But, but nor can we just say that anything they do to animals is by definition ethically acceptable, just because they're minorities or just because it's their culture. Or just, we, need, we need to, to require majorities and minorities alike to, ask, to give some ethical justification for the treatment of, uh, uh, of animals. Uh, in the back. Uh, Nanette asked my question. So. Okay. I guess we can take uh, one or two more if you're quick about it in the back. I'm Viviana Bucarelli, the Graduate Center. Um, at the very beginning of your lecture, you mentioned the uh, three mono great big monotheistic religions, but I, I was wondering, in your research, have you come across within Christianity um, with differences between uh, the Catholic and Protestant world in terms of their relationship with, uh, and, mm, with animal rights and more broadly their biocentric versus a potential anthropocentric vision? Because I came across something, but just would really would like to know what you're... Uh, so, uh, I mean, within all of, uh, all of the different religious traditions, there are uh, people writing and thinking about how their, uh, how their sacred texts, how their, how their traditions have dealt with the animal question, what, what are the different views that have been uh, expressed in the tradition, how they can be reformulated. So, so this, this, is, this is a debate that's occurring within all religious traditions, and, and um, in many cases, after, after a long silence, so, so this, these are still early days in that conversation, and I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're nowhere, it would be premature and, and, and implausible to try to make generalizations about, you know, that this tradition is, is, is uh, uh, proving to be more animal friendly or more animal rights friendly than this other tradition. Uh, Having said that, if you just if you look at just the, the numbers, I mean, if you just look at survey data, for example, um, the 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 differences uh, are the the, the um, well, I, I hesitate to say this without having the numbers in front of me, so please don't quote me, but, but, I, but I encourage you to, 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 to look these up because I think they're interesting. As I, as I remember the statistics, the, the, there is not a significant statistical difference across different, the believers of different religions. What you do find is significant difference based on whether, how important religion is to people, whatever, whatever religion they believe in. So those who are most devout, whatever their religion, tend to be less supportive of animal rights. So that's, that, uh, so I, I mean, so I think religion does shape people's uh, views of animals. And, and at the moment, 
uh, at least based on, on these surveys, it seems that, that the, the, the more deeply people are immersed and the more strongly they identify themselves in religious terms, that operates against recognition of animal rights. But I, I, I view that as, as just a, a snapshot at a particular moment in time. And I think all of these traditions are, are, are starting to be held accountable for the way they talk about animals. And, and those debates are just, just moving forward. Let me allow our, one of our fellows the last question. Thanks, uh, Jeff Flynn from Fordham University. Um, so I found this really fascinating and interesting. Uh, what, so one of the arguments that comes up in the animal rights debate, I guess, I think Regan and Cohen had this discussion about, um, well, if, an, if these animals have, if all animals have, you know, the same rights, um, then do you have a duty to stop the lion from Predation. killing the lamb kind yeah. of thing? Yeah. And, I mean, there are various ways of trying to answer that in the moral philosophical debate. Um, so I'm, but that's the background for my question. I mean, if the politics of the left is about full and complete inclusion in the moral and political community, right, and that is the goal, I yeah. take it, eliminating all forms of exclusion, it does seem like there's this ineliminable problem uh, with, with the fact that some animals yeah. will always be killing other animals in very violent ways, right? Yeah. So we can't really include animals, yeah. all animals, in the moral and political community. So that's, right. that's a real challenge. I mean, we can include children and the disabled yeah. in various ways. But. Uh, so th that gives me an opportunity to, um, uh, th to give a plug for the book, because this is, the, uh, uh, so let me just, let me just give the, as, short a can, as short as I can, uh, uh, s summary of, of the way uh, of, of the bigger political theory framework within which we situate uh, we deal with the issue of predation. So we argue that with respect to domesticated animals whom we have brought into our society, selectively bred to become dependent on us cut them off from their former existence as wild animals and brought them into our community, we need to recognize that they are members of our society and that the, tech, the tool we use to recognize membership is citizenship. So we, we argue for, for thinking of, of domesticated animals as our co-citizens. Uh, and with the possible exception of cats, and I'm, I, I, we, can, we can talk about that, 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 that all the members of this shared uh, human domesticated animal society can, can comply with the vegan imperative. Uh, with respect to non-domesticated animals, uh, many of whom are involved in predator-prey relations, uh, because we have not domesticated them, because we have not brought them into our society, they are not our co-citizens. Uh, 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 and we should, I, I don't want to get too, into too much details, but basically we, we argue that with respect to animals in the wilderness living on their own habitat, we should view those as sovereign communities with the right to govern themselves according to their own, uh, uh, their own uh, ways of life. So they have rights to autonomy and rights to territory, and we should, we should respect those. And with respect to the wild animals who live amongst us, urban wildlife, like pigeons and so on, uh, we should view them as denizens who live amongst us, even though they're not members of... This, uh, of a shared cooperative scheme, the way domesticated animals are, and so we argue that this, this, these are morally relevant differences. That with that, that with respect to all of these animals, we have no right to harm them or kill them for our benefit, except in cases of necessity and uh, self-defense and so on. Uh, so, they, so all of these animals, whether they're domesticated denizens or so sovereign wild animals, they have certain inviolable rights not to be harmed or killed for our benefit. But, but. Um, part of what it means to recognize the sovereignty of, of animals in the wilderness is to recognize that their ways of life are tied up with, with predation uh, and that there's no way for us to intervene. In, so they're, they're not in the circumstances of justice with each other. And, the only way, and if we intervened to try to, to separate predators from prey, the only way we could do that would be to... to to put each species in its own protected, fenced uh, territory, we, and then fed, uh, and then we take over the responsibility for feeding them, so we give them you know, food drops or whatever, which is to say, the only way in which we could intervene in pred predator-prey relations in the wilderness is to turn all of the wilderness into a zoo, right? In which each species has its own safe, protected territory, and we take on the responsibility of feeding them. And that is radically incompatible with any, any recognition of their interests in li living autonomously, living freely. And so, so we, we want to argue that the vegan imperative 
if you like, is, is indeed a, a part of our aspiration for what we call the zoopolis, for, for, for the shared society of humans and domesticated animals. Uh, but, that's, but quite different sorts of rules would apply to the relations between wild animals. Okay, well, you'll have an opportunity to discuss this personally uh, with uh, Will Kimlicka on the seventh floor in the Philosophy Lounge over uh, drinks and uh, vegetarian treats, uh, and some of them vegan, some not. And um, l please join me in thanking Will Kimlicka for a fantastic talk. Thank you.